from Mobile to T-Town, where he won back-to-back national titles as a starting quarterback for the Alabama Crimson Tide. Spent eight years in the NFL chasing his dream, now thriving with the St. Louis Battlehawks. Our Freshie Award for Offensive Player of the Year, best tandem with Hakeem Butler, and our most valuable player, A.J. McCarron. Welcome to Spring Ball Boulevard. Thanks for joining us, man. I appreciate you, Matty. So right off the bat, our Freshie Award for Most Valuable Player, Obviously, the league not honoring an MVP, taking a different approach. We wanted to make sure we are recognizing all the players. Uh, I saw some other accolades from some other media that you got handed out as well. Uh, what does it mean to you to get recognized as our Freshie Award MVP and then some of the others as well? Yeah, I mean, it's it's awesome, dude. Um, you know, I, I learned that the league wasn't doing that. Uh, I think going into the last week, um, one of our media personnel, uh, I can't remember if it was uh, our main guy, Brian, um, or Christina, another uh, girl that helps us out, but basically told me, hey, the league doesn't have a MVP. And I was like, wow, um, that's shocking. So um, it was, but to have, you know, the honor of winning these awards from, you know, media like yourself uh, and other media members. Um, I, I think it shows, you know, uh, the amount of work that I put in and, and us as a team that we put in because, listen, you can't achieve anything by yourself, especially in this game. And uh, and I had a hell of a team and hell of a coaching staff that helped, uh, you know, all this come about. And uh, And I can't thank them enough for it. Awesome. Well, we're glad to honor you, man. It was a great season. Uh, I want to start off the interview with my first memory of AJ McCarron. Uh So this is, this is September 10th, 2011. We're actually in the same place. Do you remember where you were that day? September 10th, 2011. (laughs) Um, That had to be, was that at uh, Penn state? That was sharp yeah. memory. So you're making your first big time start at Alabama. Yeah. You're on the road in state college. Me and 108,000 other maniacs <laughs> came into that day thinking we were going to rattle this kid. There's no way you can make your first start at Penn State, right? Like that's a quarterback's worst nightmare. Well, and it was a white. It didn't work out. <laughs> I was going to say it had all the tools. It's like, How's this? How is he going to perform? I mean, Bama whooped us the year before that down there in Tuscaloosa. So not yeah. only a revenge game, but now you're coming in, you know, first start in, uh, I guess you'd say like the power five now, but first start in major college football. And I thought you handled yourself pretty well. How'd you, what was going through your head when you step out there and you see that environment? Uh, listen, I still, to this day, you know, people ask about coolest places to play and, um, and, and, Penn State was unbelievable. Uh, like, I, I remember coming down, leaving our hotel, driving down, you know, the, the big hill or whatever, and, and, the, and the stadium sits down, um, like, in the middle of, a, of mountains, basically. And, uh, and just seeing all, all the white shirts all over the place and the fact that we were wearing white. So, like, most of our fans blended in with that. Um, but it, it, that was an unbelievable experience for me. Uh, I, I knew that we had a good team that year. Uh, I just had to take care of the football and then make plays when, when they asked me to, and, um, and especially that early in the season, kind of just grow as the season goes on. But um, I tell you what, I still talk about the, the fan base there and um, what's the, the song uh, we were winning – by a good amount towards the end, but all the fans stayed there and they were still singing, uh, what is it? Sweet Caroline. Caroline. Sweet Caroline. Yeah. <laughs> and I like still yeah. watching that uh, was, it, it's so different from most, you know, SEC schools, like SEC schools start losing. I mean, it, most of the fans are out of there, um, especially towards the end of the game, but seeing that everybody like lock arms and sway in the stadium, like that was still uh, unreal. And then, that being Joe Pa's last uh, game to be head coach before all the, you know, the stuff went down. So um, it, it was just an unreal experience and, and something I will always remember and cherish for sure. 
Yeah, and on that first drive, Penn State moving the ball a little bit, settle for a field goal. You guys come out. Thought we had you for a second. The, the stadium was loud, but as the game went on, you progressed. And obviously, Coach Saban going into halftime said he think you were doing a pretty good job. So I, just, I had to bring up that memory. While we're on the topic of college football, um, you guys were the first to go back-to-back -back in the BCS era, and then nobody had done it for a decade until Georgia just did it now. What are your thoughts on – the 12-team playoff era that's going to be coming up here in 2024? Man, uh, my my thing, Matty, is when is enough enough? Like, um, you know, that they, they got away from the BCS era because the, the third-place team was pissed off that the computer algorithm and everything that it goes down uh, to, like, they weren't in. So, all right, now you move to a four-team playoff and you create this playoff system. Well, now it just goes to the fifth team is just pissed off and that they're not in. Um, so it's going to be the same thing, I think, just happening over and over. Like, all right, you're going to 12 teams. So all of a sudden now the 13th team, in, they're in an argument about, hey, well, why isn't the 13th team in? They're better than the 10th team or the 11th team. Like, um, so I, I just don't know, like, how do you solve that issue and, and when is enough enough and then, I mean, how many games are you going to play? Like, now now you're getting into an NFL-type season, um, pushing all these games. I, I think you kill the the bowl game, um, the reputation of, of bowls, because now these people aren't going to travel. Uh, you know, like, say, that, you know, I think, what, it's the first four teams or something get a bye is the format and then yep. um the rest of them the first rounds played at home so are the teams the fan base is actually going to travel because now it's not a destination that could be a, a vacation you're going to somebody's actual campus so um i i i just i, I think you lose um the love of the bowl games a little bit doing this many teams um but Listen, the NCAA has been all over the place the last couple of years with this transfer portal and NIL deal. I, I, I really thought that the NCAA could have solved this whole issue by just, you know, um, your tuition check instead of it being $1,500 a month to every kid. The NCAA is making a, billions of dollars. So why not just say, hey, every kid's going to now make five grand a month. And you would have solved the issue. You wouldn't have certain players making millions of dollars or all these big time schools because they thought it was going to level the playing field for these smaller schools. And all it did was help, like Coach Saban said, help the bigger schools because they got the most money. They got the deeper pockets. And uh, and, and for a company like Mercedes or um, Apple or all these Beats by Dre, like it's easier for those schools to come in and want to be a part of a, a big time school rather than a small school and, and, you know, um, tag their name with that program. So, uh, I think it's all over the place. Hopefully they can figure it out though. Yeah. It's been wild. <clears throat> and also I looked at the schedule for it. They're still going to play conference title games, obviously then take a week break. So we were looking at it cause we're Penn state football season ticket holders you could potentially have a playoff game in state college with miserable weather, December 22nd. That's the first round. So if you're a fan of a team that doesn't get a first round by, you could potentially have a home game or an away game. If you choose to travel, then you're going to have your new year six be the quarterfinals. So you got to go to Arizona, new Orleans, wherever. Right. Then the, the week after is the semifinal, which is going to be, the usual CFP, so maybe Miami, Atlanta, something like that. And then the national title, if you make it that far. So that's insane. How are fans yeah. going to do that? You know, it's like bowl games were perfect because it was like you could go. That was your big destination, right? Right. And even it, I, I assume with the 14 playoff, it's tough sometimes. But, yeah, it's, it's going to be wild. I don't know. I'm, I'm only excited about it because I think it opens up the door for programs that are right on the fringe like a Penn State. But, yeah. That's just a lot of games, man. And playing, I think national title game will be January 25th. That's that's like right up against NFL playoffs then, you know? So. No, that's, that's nuts. <laughs> that's nuts. <laughs> right, right. I thought it was already late. But so that's college ball. A couple things uh, that I'm curious about kind of coming back to XFL here. Um, 
you took some you took some pretty hard shots this season. First of all, how are you physically feeling after this like 15 to 16 week run that you just went through? Yeah, I feel great now. Um, it, you know, I had taken a shot in the uh, the Houston game and um, and was able to play through. And I felt like I could have played in, in the Vegas game. But, um, you know, A.B. A- was – he he was such an unbelievable head coach this year. I mean, it was awesome to play for. And, um, but he just said, listen, we can get by, uh, we think this week, uh, without having you allow your body to heal some. And, um, and it, and it helped me out. I got to spend some time with, uh, a, a good rehab clinic down there, um, TMI and, uh, some good, uh, some really good PT guys. So, um, but now I, my body feels great. I'm I'm back home. Uh, I, I really took a week off before I got back into the swing of things and uh, hung out with some buddies, went and played a lot of golf that week. And uh, so I, I'm feeling good now. So, yeah, when I was in the uh, and when I was in St. Louis for the tour, I saw Stully and I, the first thing I asked him, I was like, is AJ going to go? And he's like, you know, stand by. We're going to have it soon. And I'm just like, let me be the week that, you know, I show up and AJ's not here. <laughs> like, so, yeah, he told me you weren't playing. Nick's out there taking uh, – going through warm-ups, and everyone's just kind of looking around the stadium like, where's AJ? But it quickly <laughs> came through the news what was going on. And, hey, they, they might have needed a fake punt touchdown and some overtime, but they got the job done. And that ended up being one of the most electric moments all season in the XFL. Uh, it so really was. It, it was really cool to watch that game. Um so when you first decided that the XFL was going to be a go for you, was it always the St. Louis Battle Hawks, or was there another team in the picture? How did that come about? Yeah, it really was just St. Louis. Um, I'd never gotten a call from anybody else. Uh, no other coaches reached out. Um, I, I don't know, you know, for whatever reason, but AB was, you know, the one that reached out. He kept calling, kept calling, and according to him, he he called three times or reached out multiple times before I ever reached uh, back out to him. So, but uh, I, I, I was just in the moment of, I was doing a lot of work for ESPN, um, college game day, uh, radio, and, and a couple digital shows. And um, so I, I was traveling a lot and, and away from the kids uh, more than usual. And um so, but he kept reaching out and, and I got to talk to him multiple times and really learn what he was about, what type of coach he was. And that was a big thing for me is, listen, I, I like having a relationship with my coaches, like being able to pick up the phone, call them, um, you know, just BS with them. And, uh, and AB was that type. I mean, he's such a player's coach. He was un- unreal in that aspect. And, and then learning from there, all right, so if we do this, what type of offense are we running? Um, and he, you know, he, he introduced me to Bruce and, uh, Bruce was, I had played against Bruce multiple times in the league. I had seen him. And, um, and so I, I knew we were in the same systems in the the NFL. And, uh, for me, it was, it was a no brainer. It was like, all right, talking to Bruce now, let's, let's link up. And, uh, and I mean, really from the jump, we hit it off and, started putting the offense together months before uh, we even announced. So that was the biggest thing is, all right, hey, terminology standpoint, all right, I see we called it this. You know, great. That's the same thing we called it. And uh, we ran this route this way, and uh, we did this read this way. So it really linked up perfect. And uh, and I tell you what, Bruce is unbelievable when it comes to uh, offensive mind for the game. And – uh and I think he has such a bright future. I can't wait for him. So that's kind of how it all starts. Obviously, Hakeem Butler reaches out over DM. You're recruiting Austin Prohl. You got some other guys that the offense is coming together. <clears throat> you guys go through the season. You end up seven and three, or actually at the end of the season there, you're six and three. You're told um, that your path to the playoffs is pretty slim, I assume, at that point. What was the understanding going into week 10? Like, what were you guys being told from the league, the coaches, whatever, about what exactly you had to do to have a, like a, the best shot at making the playoffs in week 10? Dude, I tell you what, uh, in for your viewers and and, and listeners, like, I don't know how much praise you've gotten, but uh, you you were the savior 
of the league for that uh, from that aspect. And, and I'm not uh, exaggerating one bit because I can't tell you how many people uh, were watching your podcast from even on the team and coaching staff and hell, probably the league. Um, because I, I, the, the league office, I think, was confused themselves. Um, they had sent out multiple memos about, oh, it's this. And then, you know, them working with ESPN and it, that side of it was all jacked up too. So we really, like, if it wasn't for you and, um, you know, me seeing you and watching you break it down and everything and telling AB, like, hey, you might want to reach out to this dude, Matty. Like, he seems like he knows what he's talking about and he's got everything broke down pretty well. And, uh, and so then he, he ended up reaching out to you, but, um, be honest with you, dude, we didn't have a freaking clue what the hell, like it was until you told us, all right, we got to score a bunch of points. We got to try to hold them to this amount of points, um, to kind of balance it out. And so our thing was, no, we're just going to go out and sling it. Like Bruce was like, listen, are you good to throw it as many times as we need? I'm like, let's do it. I said, hell, we, we, we've we been putting up all these numbers and we're not even an air raid offense like compared to these other teams. I'm like, Let, let's come out and, and five wide a ton and and let's just do it. Um, and, and so Bruce literally had an unbelievable game plan and, uh, and everybody just played their, their tails off and, uh, and everything matched up and we had an unbelievable night, record breaking for sure. Well, I appreciate that, first of all. And I'm not a math person whatsoever. I think my high school math teacher probably would have been shocked at some of the things that were going on. To me, it was just such a curiosity. It was like, how can you not know? How can you not want to know? Right. Like, and people were like, oh, we'll figure it out after the game. I, that that wasn't enough to me. For me, it was like, I want to watch the game in real time, like possession by possession. And I kind of want to know. And I right. get it, right? Everybody's like, just win. You know, you have to focus on winning first. Obviously, you guys would have been automatically in with a Vegas win, but right. that's too easy. For me, it's like I got to know every scenario. There were things that could happen if both teams won, and I was like, we're not talking about that, really. Yeah. So it all eventually got sorted out, but no, that means a lot, AJ, that that you guys were paying attention, and we th that's a service that we figured we had to do for players, coaches, for fans, and and it, it took some sleepless nights to plug the spreadsheets in and do all that. But at the end of the day, you know, we knew right at the end of that Seattle game what the case was. And for you guys to put up 53 and that 53 to get you exactly the same point differential on the season. It like, how do you go through 10 games and have the same point differential as a team? That's that's just unheard of. And the way it all went down, they'll literally make a documentary about it someday and and they can give me a call. I hope I'll be part of that. But 53 <laughs> should have been enough. I mean, obviously, the points against battle is, was lost. The points for was won. Yeah. Uh, so it kind of bal balanced out. But it, exceptional performance, 420 yards, six touchdowns. You guys kind of left everybody wondering what would this team have done in the playoffs since you caught fire? Um, I know Coach Saban came on last year during the SEC title. And he kind of made his case on national television. This is why you should put Alabama in the top four. Well, AJ, what was your case as to why the St. Louis Battlehawks were one of the top four teams in the XFL and could have had a shot to make the playoffs and win a title? Yeah, I, I, I really thought uh, if we got in, we, we would win it. I truly did. Uh, you know, we, we were going to get a bunch of guys back from a defensive standpoint. That, and that really hurt us in the end from on, on the defensive side is, some key guys, um, Mike Rose, some guys in the secondary, uh, Tim Harris that was battling injury um, most of the year, but uh, and some other guys that were just nicked up and trying to play through stuff. Um, and, and so they missed the, the last game, and I felt like, all right, if we can get in, they'll be back for this first round. Um, and and – uh, we'll, I think we'll have a, our, our basically our whole team. Cause crazy thing is we were healthy on offense. And, uh, and, and I think going into that last couple weeks, it started in Vegas where we kind of changed our mindset a little bit. And uh, it was, Hey, we're going to spread this thing out a little more. Um, we're we're going to try to get our weapons, the ball as quick as possible. And then also we're going to take our shots. And I, I think that was something that, whether it was not having a a true camp together and 
and then kind of getting thrown into the fire to where if you're not an air raid offense, like a lot of your your deep stuff and your play action passes is built off timing, right? So uh, from a timing standpoint up front, play fake to the amount of time you have blocking and then uh, letting routes develop. So I, I really think we, we shifted and, and Bruce did an unbelievable job of saying, hey, we're going to spread this thing out. We're going to throw it uh, and make teams cover the field. And man, from Vegas and then to Houston and then missing the Vegas game and um, and just having a bad game versus Seattle as an offense, coming back from injury and uh, and really just bad. We had a ton of penalties that game that kind of when we got something going, it brought us right back. So uh, we never found our momentum. And then going into the last game, it was uh, everybody just playing loose and we're going out here and having fun. And um, I, I think if we, we could have just got to that point, you know, we would have made a really good run at it, and uh, and hell, because we played DC close every time, and uh, it always came down to the last couple of minutes of the game. So, um, but you know, uh, it, it's hard in, in this business to go off coulda, shoulda, wouldas, and stuff like that, and if so, um, hell, DC is a great team, and uh, and they'll have a, a a great shot at winning this thing now. Yeah, and I know you guys were sharing a practice facility with them also. I know uh, you got pretty creative at times, it seemed, with the offense this season. It's like you said, you guys had kind of a short camp together. I know there were some issues, especially at the beginning of the season with the radios and, and the comms. Um, I frankly remember a game where I think you did a sideline interview. They said, oh, I'm getting the defensive calls, but I can't hear our calls. Like, what? What were the issues and, and what would you do to react when you kind of knew right away, okay, I can't really rely, I can't hear Bruce, or, you know, what What do you do in that case with the offense? i tell you, it was uh, – and, and this is why I praise Bruce so much. Like, from the very first week, he was like, hey, two-minute, we're going to install this thing, like uh, all our plays, and, and once we get the whole offense installed, he's like, two-minute, you're calling it. And I was like, you what? And he's like, the whole thing. He's like, now, if you, if you need me, I'll be there. He said, but I, I want you calling it. And so from a practice standpoint, like I just called two minute. Um, and it was really our, our, our basic offense. It, it's not like we had a two minute package or anything. And so um, it really helped when it came down to uh, that Vegas game at Vegas. I, I kept hearing uh, DA, our defense coordinator, and uh, I kept hearing Donnie, like, talk. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, and they kept saying player check. And I'm like, who – why does Bruce keep saying – but then I'm like, all right, well, that ain't Bruce's voice. Like, well, why do they keep saying player check? And uh, and so I was like, all right, well, I, I know Bruce's mindset. I, I know what he likes to do um, and what he's thinking in certain situations. So it was really just, hey, call it and go. and. Uh, and it, it, it was no panic because, like, the first play came in and I'm like I, – I remember AP being there and I was like, uh, I don't – what's the play? <laughs> and the play clock's down to, like, 15. And he's like, are you not getting it? I'm like, no, I'm not getting it. So he told me the first play. And then after that, though, uh, I, I just started waving to the sidelines and telling AP, I'm like, hey, I, I can't hear anything. So tell, tell Bruce, like, don't tell the receivers anything. Just let me call it and, and we'll go because – I didn't want them getting a call from him and then running something different from what I'm calling. So, uh, yeah, it was the, the headsets this year were coming out of halftime. We had multiple games where the headsets wouldn't work coming out of halftime, whatever they, they reset the headsets or something at halftime. Like, uh, there was multiple games where, um, we didn't have headsets. So it was, uh, it's pretty interesting from that aspect. Yeah, it causes some issues because you can't have one sideline have it and the other not. So there were times in the season where they came over and said, all right, well, theirs is killed, so we got to cut yours. And obviously right. the opposing coach is like, well, how is this my fault? Now I can't talk to my guys. Like, But it's weird that you have wide receivers hearing calls. Obviously, as a quarterback and an OC, you want to have control of the offense. Now it's beneficial for a wide receiver to be able to hear it directly from the booth, but then you have miscommunication. So I was just curious yeah. about how that all went. I like the moment this season when, when Greg McElroy was calling one of your games 
and he just knows the ins and outs of the position. And he's telling us all about different things. And you get a sideline interview and you're, you're kind of like, well, we can't tell you what that was. And Greg's up in the booth. Like we know what it was. Yeah. What was it like to be mic'd up? And do you think if you're a kid and you're watching the sport coming up, like maybe some of your boys, are you learning from that all access and, and are you taking things in or is it all too kind of confusing to, to process for someone who doesn't play? No, I, I think it's it's a cool deal um, with the XFL on doing that with quarterbacks and certain players. It, it was hard from my aspect because it was like, all right, my mom's going to hear the mic'd up version, so and my wife's going to hear it. Um, and, and they always talk about like, hey, watch your language. Um, so that that side of it was like, all right, I, I know I have to dial back a little bit and, uh, and not – get so pissed off in, in a certain situation and use this language. But um, from a learning standpoint, I thought it was really cool and, and being able to hear the quarterbacks around the league talk, uh, how they talk to certain guys, because that's one thing as a leader, you have to learn and understand quick when you're playing the quarterback position is, all right, you might be able to talk to this one receiver a certain way, but you can't talk to this other receiver this way. Um, you got to praise him and tell him, hey, it's going to be all right. You're going to make the next play. This other guy, you can, you know, jump his butt and, and get on to him and say, hey, you got to make that play. Um, so that side of it I thought was cool just to hear other quarterbacks and how they talk to guys. But um, from a learning standpoint, I, I think it's awesome. I, I think you got to hear uh, play calls and everything and, and try to break it down. And uh, I, I thought every uh, analyst that did that, for the XFL up in the booth and on the sidelines um, guys like Eric and Cole and um, Sam and uh, Greg, I, I thought they did an unbelievable job of, of breaking that down and, and learning the offenses themselves hearing the play calls uh, week in and week out. And uh, I thought that was really cool. The league doing that though. Yeah, it's definitely the future of football broadcasting. Like I mentioned this year, I'd love to see Peyton and Eli Manning sit down, you know, with what they do with the Manning cast and break down an XFL game because you get that quarterback to coach communication. Yeah. Um, also, you know, watching Aaron Rodgers my whole life, obviously I've been a big Packers fan. A lot of checks in that offense that he'll run. You did the one that Darius this year, you check out. Obviously, he he runs the route. You guys score. So um, going into my next question here, talking uh, XFL big picture going forward, I think you now have one of the biggest platforms and influences in the league. Uh, you tweeted April 23rd in response to Coach Beck that you'd love to play for this man, can't wait for next year. So first off, what are your XFL 2024 plans? And if you do come back, what would you like to see upgrade to year two? Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of taking it, to be honest we may is day by day. Uh, listen, I, it's of course I'd love my, cause my goal was to play uh, 10 years when I first came in as a rookie. All right. I want to play 10 years in the league. So, um, but I also want it to be a good situation. I don't want to just go to just uh, anybody, but um, uh, listen, I, yeah, I, I, w I would like to be back in the league and uh, I think I, I show I shown this year, you know, that I still play at a very high level and uh and, and lead an offense. So um, but if, if if it's not God's plan, like I have no problem coming back to to play in the XFL. I thought it was an unbelievable experience and um and, and I would love to sit down with the uh decision makers of the of the XFL and, and be able to say, hey, I, I think if we go this route, it'll help guys. How can we make the league better for players, um, for the fans? Um, because I, I think there, there are certain things that they can do. Um, and then from, you know, uh, a living situation and um, from a medical side of it and, and nutrition and stuff, I, I think there's ways to grow. But for the, for the first year of the league uh, coming back, like I thought it was an unbelievable experience. I really did. And, uh, I thought the league did an unbelievable job of, uh, you know, showing what the league was about, showing players uh, their stories. And, uh, and it was just an unbelievable experience and something uh, that I will definitely and, and my boys and the rest of family and friends cherish for the rest of our lives for sure. 
Absolutely. Part of history. And speaking for your position, obviously we're seeing a ton of this XFL, the NFL stuff. Now you guys have Darius, Hakeem, Austin, all kind of your teammates getting invited to mini camps. If just speaking from your position as a quarterback, if you're let's say three, four, five years out of school, you get invited to camp, you miss the 53 man. Maybe you get a, a P squad offer. Uh, how have your options changed in this football landscape if you're in that position now? And what advice would you give guys who are kind of weighing the options of whether they want to stick it out with a futures deal on practice squad, try to make it back to the 53 man or, or go play spring football? Yeah, you know, I've talked to a certain guy, uh, certain amount of guys about that. And, um, and even I'm, I'm not going to put his business out there, but an, another uh, quarterback in the XFL and um, talked about, hey, if this doesn't work out, like uh, he's like, listen, I, I'd love to come back and, and play in the XFL. So uh, I, I think it frees up a lot of guys to not have the stress and anxiety side of it too is going into these camps, like already one already being starstruck and for some of these guys and, um, you know, just so uptight because, oh, this is my opportunity. Like I, I got to make everything happen right now and, and play outside of yourself and end up having a bad camp. Right. So uh, I think it allows guys to take a deep breath, relax. Hey, just go showcase what you've shown all year, go be yourself. Um, and then if it doesn't work out, come back, get more film and, and get another opportunity, right. The, the following year. So, uh, I, I think it's going to allow guys to really be themselves and, and play more free and not having the stress of, uh, you know, everybody. I mean, it's like every, everyday people, when you get fired from your job and all of a sudden, all right, I got these bills. Like, what am I going to do next? Like, uh, what's my next step? So, um, I, I think it's going to allow guys to to be themselves and, and play better ball. What kind of impact do you think it'll make? Let's say if, if a quarterback was maybe mid twenties looking for that second contract, maybe they got drafted late round looking for that second deal, been in and out of the league. Is it possible to go ahead and play like a full XFL season, go through camp, go through the 10 week grind, no bye weeks, you know, tough living situation, obviously just a, 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 a mental focus that it requires then go to camp, right? And now maybe you make the team, maybe you make the P squad and go through another, what, six, seven months. Is that like, could you see yourself doing that back then? Is that something you would have committed to? And, and if so, how? Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely a grind. Um, and, and it's something that, uh, I mean, you you got to love what you do. So I, I truly believe that guys will want to do that. Um and I think, like you said, I think you'll have guys that are on practice squads that don't sign future deals. And, uh, hey, I, I want to get out here and show um, for whatever reason I, I was on this practice squad and uh, wasn't able to make the team, like, show what I can do and, and get a better opportunity. Um, because you see guys getting signed, even from the USFL, uh, the returner for uh, Dallas. They ended up being Perfect, a pro yeah. bowler. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I think – you're, you're going to see more guys take that route and not just sign future deals and, uh, and, and we'll be able to showcase um, teams around the league, what they can do. Yeah. It can definitely only go up from here. Obviously the XFL doing a great job of highlighting too, like, Hey, here's our guys that are getting invited to mini camps. I hope they continue that throughout the fall and really yeah. highlight these players in the off season and really champion these guys. Well, AJ, it's been a pleasure. Again, our Freshie Award winner for Offensive Player of the Year. We gave you best tandem with Hakeem Butler and also our most valuable player. Just a phenomenal season, what you're able to put together, not only from the product on the field, but I think some of the things that you did off the field were really special as well. And obviously memories that you'll never forget and the rest of the country following along in this all access format, you know, we get to hear more of your story. So great to have you on. Thank you for joining us on Spring Ball Boulevard. You know, you're a friend to us now. We'll catch up with you at some point. Best of luck here in the off season and coming up. If you have NFL plans, if you have plans to come back, whatever you do, uh, you're a friend of us. And, and I'm sure all the XFL guys are going to love seeing whatever you do here in the future. I appreciate you, Matty. And, uh, and dude, you have an unbelievable show and um, you, you earned a, a lot of viewers, um, just players around the league, coaches. Uh, I mean, you do unbelievable work and uh, we got to get you a, St. Louis jersey. I'm going to 
get get our uh, get our equipment guy Todd to to uh, send you a St. Louis jersey so we can get one in the back.